Thank you. Nice full house, good to see. One of the, one of the big issues of our time, really, is what we're talking about, uh, but an issue with sub-issues that, uh, that has been challenge, challenging this country for a very long time. Issues on which we've sometimes taken two steps forward and one step back, but where often we've taken one step forward and two steps back. Pretty critical moment in our history. Uh, we've seen an opportunity uh, to make a big move in relation to changing our constitution, and we're seeing that uh, at risk of turning to dust, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. In fact, I imagine many of you saw uh, Noel Pearson speak yesterday, so we'll have some idea of the issues stirring him at present about a long journey of activism, uh, but particularly in relation to the Turnbull government's rejection of a key recommendation for constitutional change by the 16-person referendum council, a council created in December 2015 in a rare burst of bipartisanship between Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten to establish a national indigenous representative voice to advise the parliament on indigenous issues. Now the referendum council left it to the parliament to write the legislative framework for the advisory body Malcolm, Tur Malcolm Turnbull rejected the whole proposition on the basis that it would become a third chamber of the National Parliament in addition to the House of Representatives, Re Representatives in the Senate. So today I want to draw on what Noel Pearson has had to say since the Turnbull uh, rejection, including in his session yesterday, uh, to get a better sense of where that rejection has left the thrust for constitutional change for Indigenous Australians. But Noel has also acknowledged uh, a massive personal rethink on his part on the whole political strategy he's adopted over nearly two decades uh, based on a belief that Indigenous leaders have to work with and through Conservative governments to achieve their goals because no lasting gains can be enshrined into the future without the support of both sides of politics. He's now uh, rejected that view to a degree and made an honest and painful acknowledgement of things that he believes he got wrong. And I want to explore that issue too because believe me, particularly in today's environment where leaders find it hard to say anything of meaning, let alone to say, gee, I made a mistake. Um, uh, I find it compelling that this man is big enough to say, I got something very important wrong. Noel, I want to start by testing Malcolm Turnbull's claim that the National Indigenous Advisory Body proposed by you and the other council members would become a third chamber of parliament, which he said the Australian people wouldn't wear in a referendum. Now, why wouldn't such a body become a third chamber? Well, the reason for putting this proposed representative body in the constitution was to give the body necessary status. If a parliament is going to listen to a body, the body needs to have appropriate status and Placing a reference to it in the national constitution is the highest form of status we could accord to that body. The second reason for putting it in the constitution was that there have been about five or six permutations of national bodies in the past, starting in the 1970s, various committees and so on, the high point of which was ATSEC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, all of which were abolished at the whim of the government of the day. And uh, so the thought from the Referendum Council and importantly, indigenous people across the country in the preceding process of dialogues um, in, across 12 regions of the country, everyone said, we can't go through an exercise in developing a representative body that can be torn down once again. And there is no guarantee that a parliament would ever revoke any legislation setting up a body, but because there would be reference to it in the constitution, it would make that uh, uh, a much more um, difficult thing for parliament to do. Um, and in any case, if there was a change, they would have to replace it with something else. That's why putting the Indigenous voice in the Constitution is so important to guarantee the existence of an advisory body 
um, for the long term. But the actual, the actual framework uh, of that body, the number of people, how they would get there, how they would be made up, um, what powers, if any, they would have, the entire structure and framework of that body would be in the hands of the elected parliament to decide, right? Correct. That is the, that is the deal you've put up. Absolutely. The provision, and the Referendum Council never actually proposed a set of words about how, what wording should be in the constitution. It just said, uh, we recommend that a, that a, that a voice be uh, implemented in the constitution. So, it, it, but the provision would allow the, would empower the parliament to create the body. So at the end of the day, what powers and functions and how people are elected, what job it would do, um, would be entirely for the parliament to determine via legislation. And since, since the government of the day would have the numbers at least in the House of Representatives, um, it would be the government of the day in the first instance that would lay out the framework for that advisory body so it's in the hands of the elected members of parliament to determine uh, whether, whether the body has no more power than to be able to offer advice from time to time on particular issues which advice could be ignored after a process of consideration in the parliament. Correct. That's the principle of parliamentary supremacy. Every constitutional conservative is concerned about parliamentary supremacy and the proposal for a voice is consistent with the idea of parliamentary supremacy because it would be the parliament of the day that legislated uh, the functions and powers of the voice. Now I know that uh, while the, the, the council itself didn't come up with proposed frameworks, I think your Cape York Institute uh, was asked and came up with a report of how such a council might be, uh, an advisory council might be set up. So uh, give us a sense of a model that, that would give us an idea of how it would work. I mean, uh, within that institute report, did you come up with uh, how many, uh, 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 how the broad indigenous population would be represented? Would people be chosen by a vote? Uh, how would you determine the numbers that were on that council? How often would they meet and so on? Well, throughout the dialogues that we held in 12 regions across the country, Cairns, Torres Strait, Broome, Alice Springs, Perth, Darwin, Adelaide, Melbourne, Hobart, Dubbo, Brisbane. Uh, in each of those dialogues, the, the view was that it was the First Nations that are the constituency of such a body. So the WIC peoples are a First Nation of Australia. They were here before the coming of Europeans. And the Miriam people of Murray Island, they're a First Nation. So the footprint for such a body would be these First Nations, the Wiradjuri of New South Wales, the Pitjantjara of Central Australia, um, all of the Noongar of Perth. These First Nations would be represented in this voice and uh, many of them, these, these First Nations would have a choice. This is the Cape York Institute's view. A lot of them would have a, a, a vote of the, of the First Nations of those places. Th these are the First Nations that Australians almost every other day get welcomed to their country. Yes. They're the footprint for this voice to the parliament. And, and But some of them, and particularly I explained this to Malcolm Turnbull, some traditional communities in particular, such as Gullaroy Yunipingu's mob, they have their own customary processes for selecting their representatives. And they should have the ability to select their representatives according to their laws and customs. And, and Turnbull really struggled with that. Yes. He said, well, you know, we, we have a one one vote, one value system. Well, Noel, you'd have to acknowledge this in a way. I mean, a, a politician is always occupied with how he or she sells something to the broader public, to the voting public. And I would think one of the first things any politician grapples with is, OK, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, I can see this might have virtues, but what are th what is the basis on which I sell it? Yeah. Uh, so you're asking a white leader 
to explain to broadly non-Indigenous people uh, how Indigenous, how First Nations, different First Nations might want to elect their representatives onto that body differently. It's not necessarily an easy proposition where you've got so many carpers on the sidelines with their own agendas to shoot you down. Yeah, I, I acknowledge that, but at the same time, this is a process of recognition. And if people have a different customary system of selecting their leaders from simply a democratic vote, do we recognise that? And, and some of the structures in traditional communities uh, are very important to them. Mm. And uh, we wanted to retain the flexibility. And, and of course, a system like that would set out in regulation that the minister would say that in this region, these First Nations will use their traditional processes for selecting their representation. But in, in other regions, those regions may choose a one vote, one value system. Now, presumably that would have to have oversight. There would have to be some, presumably the Electoral Commission would have to have some Correct. kind of oversight. So they, with the communities, would have to devise a way. Which is what They'd have to be able to, to, to lay out very clearly what the process would be and then work out how to supervise that process for its integrity. Which is what happened with ATSIC. The right. Australian Electoral Commission undertook the whole supervision of the election process. Mm. Now, Malcolm Turnbull, in, in, in arguing his case that this council would become a third, um, a, a third chamber of parliament, uh, and if you're saying it's a third chamber of parliament, you are saying that it has powers to pass or powers to veto in the same way that the House of Representatives or the Senate. Um, but your argument is it's a purely advisory body. But he says, look, every, well, you say it's there for the Parliament to refer issues that relate to Indigenous Australians for discussion and advice. But since every bit of policy that applies to other Australians would also imply to Indigenous, indigenous Australians, therefore every bit and piece of policy that's ever generated in the Parliament would automatically have to be um, referred to the Advisory Council. What do you say to that? Well, any person commenting on legislation in the Parliament, including the major parties, including the minor parties, independents, they've, out of the kind of torrent of issues flowing through the Parliament, they have to select what they can deal with what is of interest to their constituency and what they have the wherewithal to participate and debate on and comment on. It would be the same with us. You know, but ARC, who would determine that? Uh, there would be a body that determines that these are subject. There will be occasions when the Taxation Act is relevant to First Nations. Royalties and other regimes and charitable status of Indigenous organisations these are taxation matters that will be of great interest, that are of great relevance to First Nations today, and why should they not have the ability to provide advice to the Parliament on those things? Environment. I issues to do with the, with the environment will be of, of, of explicit interest to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So the, the, the divining what it is that you choose to take a position on is something that the Greens do every day, that the Democrats used to do and individual parliamentarians do and so on. Um, in, our, in, in the case of the proposed First Nations voice, at the end of the day, we don't get a vote. It's a voice to the parliament, not a voice in the parliament. But it became, it's folded into the automatic process. I mean, you've got a churn of legislation going through all the time. You've yep. got legislation being introduced in the House of Representatives, to being debated, being considered by committee, passing on to the Senate. And as the Senate is considering this, the reps is moved on to something else. Then the, the first lot of legislation comes. But so there's that churn between those two chambers. Does this mean that you would, you would be adding to the churn by that other process? So, so your advisory council, the, the First Nations, or, or let's call it the voice, the, the voice for Indigenous Australia would receive, would, 
At what stage of that legislative process would matters be referred to you? Well, Presumably before there's ever going to be a vote. F firstly, it could not slow down the process. So you've got to be sitting simultaneously. So you've, got to be, you've got to be providing the advice um, and, and presumably you would be providing the advice ahead of time wherever possible in order to influence the outcome. So maybe through the committee process? Through the through committee processes and so on. So, um, so you, would you be having your debate, I'll say your, yeah. would you be having your debates in public in the same way in, in, in the two parliamentary forums? Or would it be like more of, more of a cabinet process where it's behind closed doors and then uh, a, a single piece of advice or a set of advice is then issued with the unanimous, as the unanimous view of the council? Well, ultimately, the power of the body will be political. It is giving a political voice in the national democratic process. Uh, the, the body's status will give Indigenous people a national amplifier. Hmm. And that must be a good thing. If our affairs are going to make any sense in the future, we've got to have a democratic uh, amplifier. Now, and, how many and First Nations are there? Um, or oh, 200 plus around the country. So each and of those First Nations would have at what one well, representative. There'd be, a, there'd be a college process right. to distill a, a national representative gr group. That so you wouldn't can, have 200. Absolutely. No. But the forums would happen where those groups get together and formulate their. So decisions. it's really quite a quite a complex process if well, you're talking about. And I think you talk about small platoons. Yeah. In terms of drawing on the, the thoughts uh, of individual uh, Indigenous Australians? The precise details, this is my view, Yes, right? I know. But the precise details of how this would all work would need to be subject of the design of a bill. And in our view, we proposed a joint parliamentary committee go out and speak to Indigenous Australian communities and the wider public about how this voice is precisely designed. Mm. But the main design features that are very clear are that it would not slow the process of Parliament, it cannot veto anything the Parliament ultimately passes, and, uh, and the processes of election function and power are ultimately determined by the Parliament of the day. It's hard to see how it's not going to slow the process of Parliament to some degree. I mean, you'd be, doing, you'd be working pretty fast sometimes very complex issues that need serious deliberation, yep. consultation and so on. Hard to see how it's not going to add time to the process. Well, in legal effect, it cannot. Right. The Parliament can't be So a way would have to be sought. So, you know, the, the overnight passage of legislation could still happen. Hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the Institute of Public Affairs has said that, quote, the suggestion that every Indigenous Australian can or should be represented by a single body is deeply patronising, which I thought was particularly specious. Mm. Uh, do you give any credence to that? Oh, absolutely not. But they've had a... Uh, they've had the greatest say in the position that Turnbull ultimately took. Mm. The Institute of Public Affairs, with all of those specious arguments, succeeded in getting Turnbull to adopt their position in relation to constitutional reform. When in fact, I would have thought that that was exactly what the federal parliament was. A single body, as in the House of Representatives, a single body representing uh, every Australian. Yeah. How, um, how deeply patronising is the federal parliament then? <laughs> um, you don't actually need a referendum to give authority to the kind of Indigenous body that you're talking about, but I, I've heard what you've said at the start, yep. that it's about giving it a particular authority and making it impossible for, I mean, I imagine by legislation, a body that can be created by legislation can be disbanded by legislation, but something else Correct. would have to replace it, and the government that disbanded one and replaced it would then have to stand up and justify and prove the legitimacy of the replacement body. So Correct. yes, I, I understand that. But you've now taken the view that since, in your view, Malcolm Turnbull has killed the proposition dead, stone dead, you now talk about the red line roadmap, mm. which is to flip it the other way, right? So just explain that. 
So you could have a referendum at the beginning of the process and then legislation setting up the body and so on. Or you could have the setting up of the body, its enactment, and then a referendum at the end of the process. And the first one we dubbed the blue line strategy and the second was, one was the red line strategy. I did become concerned that the, we weren't getting any signal of understanding or support from the Prime Minister, that notwithstanding every explanation we gave and the fact that we pointed out to him, how could this be a third chamber if you won't legislate it to be a third chamber? It'll be within your power, Malcolm. And in a, in a particularly in a particular meeting I had with him in Brisbane, uh, where I said that um, I was, uh, you know, this body would not be a third chamber, he then provocatively said to me, Lord Pearson. Uh, what would that make him? <laughs> <laughs> and, but th th that was the kind of shallow political line they had prepared, that we were proposing some kind of House of Lords, third chamber of parliament and so on. They were the attack lines that they used quite mercilessly uh, at the end of the day. They knew it was an absolute lie. They knew it was within their power to design the voice at the end of the day. But um, I think that the red line strategy, which I which we, we proposed as possibly an alternative, that we legislate the body first so that Australians could see it, feel it, touch it, and then understand that perhaps it's not s such a wild idea to vote for it in a referendum. So we're definitely in, in um, we, we need to consider both strategies going forward. But of course, uh, the, the party to all of this that we haven't talked about today, beyond my very brief mention in the introduction, is the Labor Party, uh, which may possibly become the next government. But they were a little bit shaky on their tootsies uh, when, when the council, the referendum council, made its, put its proposition. I think that both uh, Pat Dodson and Linda Burney initially said that they were opposed to it. Uh, and then Bill Shorten came in and said he could see, uh, he believed that this was well worth considering and could be made to work. So not a, not a great start in their response that would fill you with enormous confidence. Well, you know, what Indigenous Australia did in this last year was absolutely um, heroic. We went out to 12 regions I did not personally go to all of them. These were led by Megan Davis and Pat Anderson and uh, the Indigenous members of the Referendum Council. They went out to these 12 regions, collated the views of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across the country, brought them together at Uluru and made a statement called the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And this heroic process of bringing together a consensus, uh, an, an important consensus in the Uluru Statement um, that called for the voice as the proposition to go forward. The Referendum Council then adopts that Uluru Statement call. Mm. So you've got two ducks completely in alignment, not a millimetre off beam. And the third thing that needed to happen was we needed politicians to now line up without equivocation uh, behind those two points. Rachel Stewart from the Greens was the only one that did so. Um, <laughs> which is ironic, which is ironic given that the two holdouts in the Senate for a long time on the Mabo bill all that time ago yeah, were the, the Greens, Greens yeah. until Paul Keating so, threatened to go to Western Australia and blow them out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> so the Green Duck was lined up and 
and we needed labour lined up and the problem was that the alignment wasn't there. I believe that in the immediate wake of Uluru and the immediate wake of the Referendum Council's report, we needed all progressive players in alignment. Otherwise, we were going to give to the Conservatives and Turnbull um, the opportunity to wriggle out of a consensus that in many ways had been led by the former Chief Justice, Murray Gleeson. Megan Davis and Murray Gleeson were at one in the drafting of the, of the Referendum Council's report. And, Which went to those two sections of the Constitution. Correct. 122 uh, and 51. Correct. Yeah. And the, the, um, the alignment of the planets was there. We needed Labor to lock in absolutely. It took too long for that to happen. So uh, let's assume for the moment is that the Indigenous leadership lines up behind uh, your red line roadmap and they opt to pursue uh, a policy to be adopted by government uh, that an advisory council be set up through legislation uh, and presumably allow the Australian people to see that in operation before then moving to the next stage of framing a proposition for a vote to a referendum. So how confident are you that you could rely on Labor to walk down that road? Oh, I'm taking great confidence in what Bill Shorten has said. He's been consistent about the voice. As I say, I regret that it took too long for them to settle on that position. That, that small leeway, and it's a real lesson for those of us involved in progressive politics. We give leeway, we lose. You know, if we don't face up to the path and the opportunity ahead and we muck around, we lose opportunity. Mm. And at a, at a time when it was completely crucial that the planets line up and that we crowbar the remaining planet into position, um, we squibbed it. Does this mean that if Labor in opposition adopts as policy going into the next election that in fact it would move to establish by legislation uh, an Indigenous advisory body, a voice for First Nations, that uh, you would expect to see Indigenous leaders lining up in support of that Labor, uh, in support of Labor going into the next election? That's our expectation, that's my expectation. Of course, the importance of the voice is not just to provide advice to the parliament, it is to be a party to agreement making. If you're going to have agreement making in this country between First Nations and governments um, as a way to do business, then, then you need a formal body to negotiate with. And so the concept of a Makarata, yes. a, a peacemaking deal after a conflict, the Yolngu word for Makarata, a peacemaking after conflict, a reconciliation after conflict, a binding of the wounds after war, the Makarata ultimately is one that has to be negotiated between a voice and the government of the day and the parliament. So, so the voice is, is crucial for that reason as well. So just explain, this is the Makarata Commission that was also recommended by the Referendum Council. Yes. So you, you talk about a, um, a, a, a process for reconciliation, uh, truth and reconciliation. I mean, it sounded sound, not, not the same as, but it sounded like a variation of what we saw um, in South Africa after the election of Mandela and the ANC. Yeah. Uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was led essentially by Bishop Tutu, which was, I think, seen by, is, has now been seen by history to be resoundingly successful, no matter how troubling the path to true democracy is in South Africa. So, si similar concept in a way? Yes. The it, airing. It is inspired by that process. And how long, uh, I mean, is that an ongoing commission or is it one that would run for a period during which there would be time allowed 
for the stories to be told, the truths to be established, the yes. history to be enshrined in a way. At a national level and at the regional level, the important thing is the telling of the local histories of Cape York, of Arnhem Land, of South East Queensland. The, the local histories affecting the First Nations are histories that uh, can be illuminated by a truth-telling commission. And, and the, this concept of the truth-telling commission and its importance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples came out of the dialogues. It wasn't taken to the dialogues by the referendum council. It came out of the discussions there. Mm. People placed a high premium on the necessity of that process so that we come to terms with our history, not just in terms of a national story of colonisation and survival, but local and regional histories uh, about the conflicts and, and are coming to terms with our heritage and history. And so the truth-telling com commission idea came out of the, the dialogues across Australia and the idea of a Makarata Commission would, we would, is that we would have, like the Waitangi Tribunal in New Zealand, an umpire. An umpire established to supervise agreement making between governments and First Nations. As a permanent statutory body? Um, for as long as it takes for the agreement making to run their course. And you, you, you see that the two of them, that each is tied to the other, that you, that you don't want or can't have that advisory body without the commission, without the Makarata truth-telling commission. Absolutely, and you can't have, it is, there's, there's strong articulation by Senator Dodson and the Labor Party around the necessity of the Makarata and the Makarata commission. Um, however, the discussion around the country in 2016 was a discussion about, well, if we're going to have a Makarata process, we need a voice to represent us in that process. So it's, it is intimately tied to each other. Now, um, remembering how some people, particularly on the extremities of the right, played fast and loose with the Stolen Generations uh, inquiry, and a lot of waters were muddied and a lot of mud was thrown through that process. A lot of dog whistling was done. Yeah. Um, I would have thought that Bill Shorten would be pretty cautious about how that could blow up in his face potentially, particularly if you've got such a, such a big and powerful strand of the Australian media in the Murdoch block. If it decides as a block, as they do sometimes do, that it is going to oppose a Makarata Commission. I would imagine there'd be some nervous Nellies behind Bill Shorten, if not within Bill Shorten himself, about the capacity for that to divert their campaign from its main messages. Hmm. Where are you? Yeah, it, it is a worry. And dog whistling has become part of the political culture over the last 20 years. Um, it is a a wicked strain in our politics. It is a worldwide phenomenon, but we have put it firmly... We're pretty good at it. We're pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, and Kerry, I first spoke about that in an address I gave in the 96 campaign um, at the Sydney Institute. Because when I saw the Conservatives' headline campaign slogan, for all of us, I immediately saw in round brackets but not for them. And uh, I re recall reading um, Kate McGregor's article in the articles in the Fin Review analysing the adoption of Republican tactics by the Conservatives in the lead up to the 96 campaign. And everybody thought my thesis was mad at the time, but this introduction of subtle divisioning and fragmentation of the Australian community, turning Australians against Australians. Started in 96, we woke up it to it too late. You know, the conversation about dog whistling never became part of the, 
discourse until possibly 2001. Yeah. And, and, but, it, but it already commenced back in 96. Mm. And, and my view at the time was that, you know, Keating was susceptible to two assumptions in the Australian community that were dangerous for him. One, he was for Mabo. So I thought Mabo would ultimately become a albatross around his throat, and uh, and yet it was it, it you know looking back now, one of the great uh, illustrations of the st of a strength of leadership. Absolutely, Dis <laughs> and and despite the vulnerability there, he never wavered. He never wavered on Mabo. He never said, "Oh, I better." arm's length the blackfellas because they're going to they're going to go after me um, and misrepresent Redfern Park which was a uh, not about guilt it is about opening our hearts he explicitly said that it shouldn't be about guilt hmm. but about open hearts and yet the conservatives did manage to put out to the Australian community the sense of the black armband view of history and yet in 1990, he made the Redfern speech four months before the 1993 election when a tiny number of people in this country believed he could actually win that election and even he had his doubts. He was still prepared to make that speech knowing the risks involved, knowing that there probably wasn't a single positive vote in it for him and there was a significant chance of losing votes. Yeah. Yet he still did it and he won the election. Now, do you think there's a message in that for Bill Shorten? I think so. I think in any community there are bad devils and better angels and it's just a question of which one you want to summon up. Mm. You've said in the recent past through this whole reaction to Malcolm Turnbull's views on the referendum uh, opinion uh, that, um, that there have been times and you nominated the, uh, the same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite that there have been times when the Australian people have shown a fundamental decency about them, that we are not the mean-spirited country that, that some uh, seek to believe and exploit. But, uh, but, but there have been so many times in our history, again, where you see a moment like that and then you see the step back. Mm. Uh, we are easily exploited, aren't we? We can be vulnerable and are vulnerable to exploitation as a nation of people, regardless of what level of decency is in all of us or each of us, we are still easily open to exploitation, are we not? Yeah, which is why my so-called long game started after 98. I really, I was at my most bitter point along with many hundreds of thousands of other Australians after the 98 election, because I thought something of the Keating legacy had to be preserved at desperate cost of such importance to the country. And when it all fell away after the 98 loss, I, I then came to the view that, um, that you know, this, this dissent that had happened when I, I was always of the view that Howard had conjured Hanson. He had conjured Hanson out of our midst. She's just the physical manifestation of that conjuring. And, 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 and the, the political manifestation of that, that, the, the, that conjuring that had taken place from 96 to 98. And, 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 of course, relentlessly it went on. He mightn't have seen, he mightn't have seen with, great, with complete clarity what was to come with Hanson and what was being unleashed through Hanson because it did come back to bite him on the arse. But, uh, but, but it has to be acknowledged that what she was tapping in for that matter, matter deep breath, um, what, what Donald Trump has tapped, which is a deep level of anxiety, predominantly in white... Uh, uh, America and predominantly in poor, uh, not necessarily poor Australia, uh, 
but that there is a deep vein of anxiety which is a part of what is skewing the whole political process at the moment. Yeah. I mean, there was something real that Hanson, instinctively or not, did tap. Yeah. My, my thesis has been more cynical than that. That, in fact, she is... She, she was always... The subterrain was always there and someone had to deliberately conjure it. Dangerous what, beast which, to let out, isn't it? Which is what Richard Nixon did, right? You know, the Southern strategy in the United States done a generation before us conjured that, uh, that constituency that Trump now so relentlessly capitalises mm. on and uh, done very deliberately. And, and, and my cynical view is that the Conservatives deliberately pursued a Southern-style strategy in the lead-up to the 96 election, and it yielded them 20 years of returns. Mm -hmm. But I'm coming now to the article that you wrote uh, for the current, I think it's still the current monthly, um, in which you explain, you laid out uh, a complete change of heart on your part that the strategy that you've employed since, I think, say, 98, uh, since, say, since 1999, which was one where, in your terms, you chose to dance with the devil, but in the dancing with the devil, who you identified, that is, the conservative side of, of parliament, you actually turned on the left. You were quite excoriating it from time to time about the left uh, and its misguidedness. Uh, so it wasn't as if in that process you were seen to be reaching across, trying to build the bridge across the divide between right and left. You really had turned three quarters to the right, hadn't you? Mm. And you, you, in seeking to use John Howard, in the end, weren't you used more by him than he was used by you? Okay. No, I don't accept that. Say in relate, my, my, my understanding has always been that the left, the progressives have a whole suite of policies that are, I am in f complete alignment with, completely in tune with, land rights, human rights. Um, the right actually have some policies about development and economic self-reliance and so on that are also important that I'm in tune with. Um, so when the left, for example, proposed a tax on our land rights based on environmentalism, what do I do? When Paul Keating and the High Court give me Marbo and the left want to take my Marbo rights and put a blanket on them to stop us from development, what do I do? So, you know, it's, it's not entirely a simple story of good and bad. The, the story of left and right often in the pursuit of progressive politics is sometimes the left are dumb. They're not smart. Um, and sometimes the right are compassionate, but at the end of the day, what I did learn is the compassion ultimately is limited. Um, so my, you know, when I say that, that I've reached the end of the road with the right, I understand that their compassion ultimately is limited, but the progressive side have got to grow our brains. Come on. We're not going to save the planet. We're not going to get over disadvantage. We're not going to achieve social justice if we don't get smart. And you can't take our land rights away no matter how compelling environmentalism is, don't tell, it's supposed to be self-determination. It's our land. You talk about justice, then we should decide what happens to our land. So that's where my points of ruction came about, that in the pursuit for example, self-justice. What do I think is the first step in self-justice? For our children to read. And I have more resonance with our education agenda with the right than I do with the left. 
And uh, are you finding anyone from the left coming round on that? Because you're claiming uh, quite substantial proof that uh, that direct instruction is working. I mean, I, it wouldn't help you in the eyes of some on the left, I suppose, that uh, Christopher Pine keeps giving you money because he thinks and hopes that uh, that this that direct instruction will prove so successful that he can broaden it out to the whole country. Yeah. So, in other words, he has his own agenda. But Absolutely. But my father went to grade four, Kerry. He couldn't go any further. My mum couldn't speak English. I can speak English as good as any white fella in this country as a result of direct instruction. The first place for justice is for kids to be able to read and get a good education. And, uh, and I can't resile from that. If the left were genuine about empowering lower class people, and I'm talking about the lowest of the lower class here, if the left were serious about social justice, we would place education and empowerment at the front of our noses. Is there an automatic correlation between poor education, between poor literacy skills and imprisonment? Oh, Ultimately, imprisonment. Our prisons are overflowing, disproportionately occupied by our people, and you look at the correlation between who's in jail and who is literate, who's had an education, you can see it very plainly. You know, in, 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 in some sense, the poor schools that service our people, not just in remote areas, by the way, in the suburbs, the poor schools that service our people are preparatory for imprisonment. Yeah. So, why is it still an issue? If the evidence is clear that it's working, why is it still such a bone of contention? Because, in fact, you had a Queensland Labor government, while you've got a federal Conservative government supporting that program financially, you've got a state Labor government in Queensland that basically took your school back under its control, where it was shared control. The school in Aracoon is now fully under state control. And after 12 months, the school is in a parlous hole. The kids we educated are now at Brisbane Grammar and at Ashgrove Morris Brothers and, and uh, Clayfield College and so on. And the kids that will come out of the school now, I fear for them. Because Arakun School has gone backwards, big time. And, you know, a state Labor government that does that to us for perverse reasons, having nothing to do with the actual school, but because of the political conflicts I had with them in relation to the environment. You're saying that decision was payback? It was payback. So the head of a, the head of a, a, a state bureaucracy would be a part of that game? And the politicians. It was but, payback but for it, wild It's one rivers. thing for politicians to play those games. It's another uh, for a senior bureaucrat to engage in what you're describing as a political vendetta. Well, the way I've been in this game 25 years, Terry, I know every trick, I know every experience. When you run a non-government non organisation and you're battling with the powers of the day in, in government, it's a constant exercise in how freely can you speak and how freely can you act lest they take umbrage and, 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 and start to damage the work that you're trying to do. Hmm. I mean, everybody does that, right? Everybody so, lives under that, that fear. Yeah. But in our case, the, the, the Arakun school result is probably the, the, the single most tragic loss that I have ever suffered. Be and it's, it's tragic not, not because what people think of me, but because of the children whose futures are at stake, whose one chance to get out of the hole is taken away from them. How many other schools across the top uh, uh, have now applied the principles of direct instruction and well, what's been the outcome? Well, we've worked with 40 schools in remote areas in Northern Territory and Western Australia. 
Uh, we had an evaluation done by the University of Melbourne that shows the, the, sh the lift in their performance with literacy. But the thing about the program is that you only need to go to Broad Beach State School on the Gold Coast to see a school that's gone from the middle of the Gold Coast back to near the top in three years using the same programs we use in Cape York. There, there are schools all over the country that are, that are using direct instruction that have used it for decades. And this is the strange and curious thing that this is an old program going back to the 70s. I used it. I am a product of direct instruction. Good heavens. <laughs> and, and, you know, it never, I never lost a love of literature or reading. In fact, by being fluent and well schooled, it, it just increased my love of literature. So what about secondary education, Noel? I mean, clearly and obviously primary is, is the vital beginning of it all and secondary is the finishing off uh, and the prep for university and the, and, and the rest of life. Um, but but do you, is, your, is your vision ultimately one where you can, you can have a strong continuous cycle from the beginning of school to the end of school in these communities? Do they always... Will it only ever work if they're always being then farmed out to capital uh, city you, you private go to schools? Secondary schools in remote areas I've never seen work. And so I've been a pretty jaundiced uh, supporter of boarding schools. Um, Is that a feature of, of the combination of any normal juvenile and the churn inside them, but combined with the, with the poverty and the social conflict and social issues that they're oh, living it, in. It, it's got to do with scale. You just can't provide a decent secondary education in small communities where you can't attract the number of teachers, you can't offer all of the subjects, so on and so forth. So every post-primary facility that I've ever seen across the country provided in a remote small community has been teenage babysitting and not right. a real secondary education. Yeah. So, it all, so it's just a fact of life that it's they will always have to go away for secondary school. And boarding school is not easy, but what makes boarding school much easier is if the primary school has prepared them as best possible to cope. Now, coming back to the monthly article, you said, I am full of regrets. I mean, there's a sense of sadness about that. I mean, I'm assuming that along with those regrets, you've still got hope and you've still got conviction. But what is the fundamental regret? Because to say you regret something is, is an acknowledgement of failure. You're not regretting success. So what, what is your fundamental regret? Well, all along the way, you've got to make choices and make decisions, and I made a lot of dumb ones. You know, it's just a regret about the choices you make. I make a lot of smart ones, but it's the dumb ones that do damage and, and perhaps miss opportunities. I, I wonder if we had, uh, you know, perhaps, my whole, what I do regret is I, I urge that we hunt at the five o'clock position on the clock face, that is, on the far right. Yeah, if you want a majority of voters in the majority of the states, you've got to start at five o'clock. But my, what I regret is the assumption that you could, you could disregard everybody to the left of that in trying to get decent conservatives on board. And, and we, we never nurtured the middle, and we never nurtured the left. Um, and I, you know, and, and I, that is a fundamental regret, and perhaps I was intemperate in my, uh, some of the things I said about the left. Um, but, you know, it's not as if I didn't explain this strategy quite a number of times over the course of the 20 years. This is about, about the, um, not the critical centre, but about the radical centre. About the radical centre. 
Yeah. And you associate the, the, the concept of the radical centre with Paul Keating and, uh, and the, the, the ground that Labor occupied in the Hawke-Keating reform years. Yeah. The radicalism was the, was the reform process and the centre was what Labor occupied in pushing the Liberals further to the right. Absolutely. And, and I think that's the country can gather around the radical centre and it is different from a weak compromise. It's not just cutting it down the middle between the left and the right. Mm. That is not a radical centre. There's a, there's a particular point where the radical centre uh, coalesces. And, and it's the intensity of trying to reconcile positions from the left and the right that lead you to that point. A position. So, so the voice, for example, has a whole lot of conservatives on board. Notwithstanding Tony Abbott's bastardry and Malcolm Turnbull's weakness, notwithstanding that, there's a whole heap of conservatives who have coalesced around the voice, around the radical centre. Um, you know, G Greg Craven from Australian Catholic University, a, a leading opponent who was the first to sign on to the voice. Lieutenant um, Jeffrey and so on. Whole heaps of conservatives have supported us in the search for the radical center. Um, so, you know, when you, when you seek, to, and, and I can tell you guys, I have to say, Kerry, that those of us who are concerned about the fate of the planet, if we just think that we can pull it all to the left as a solution, we're wrong. They're pulling vigorously to the right and they're winning. The place to pull it to is the radical center of such an important issue as the fate of the planet and climate change. Every important political issue in my view, if you can't locate the radical center of that position as Keating and Hawke did, in relation to the economy and the social wage. You know, it's not neo. Keating and Hawke were not about neoliberalism. They were about inclusive opportunity and growth. That's how you should label them. And, and in relation to this indigenous issue, the voice is the radical centre. It is a position capable of obtaining support from leading constitutional conservatives. And, and yes, that leaves a bad taste in the mouth of the typical progressive, yeah? You don't like the idea that someone like Greg Craven or, or some old conservatives would support a position like that. But if we're smart about it, we have to understand we need Greg Craven. We need a whole lot of constitutional conservatives to support the position in order to bring um, Australians around uh, around a position like that, and and I think this is a truism for for all of our political hopes and endeavours that we have got to f not engage in this tug of war between left and right, pulling one way and ultimately losing, um, but we've got to try and nail the radical centre. Okay, now we're we're right on time, and I want to end. Um, with uh, the kind of the classic big picture question, if you like. Uh, I want you to look forward a decade and tell me what, what is your reasonable hope for, uh, as an illustration more broadly of First Nations, what is your reasonable hope uh, for the Cape York communities 10 years from now? And secondly, uh, what is, in terms of the the agendas that you have been supporting, uh, what is your reasonable hope 10 years from now uh, from the broader national, on the broader national landscape? As quickly as you can. Okay. I think we can get there in 10 years. We can get there in 10 years. We have all of the makings to get this right. The idea of the voice is a crucial part of it. The idea of empowerment of our people, from reading to better health 
to early childhood, all of the things, access to opportunity. We can get that right and we can empower our First Nations in this country. Um, and the third piece is we want Australians to embrace our culture. This profoundly old culture, 65,000 years in the making, can be preserved as the heritage of all Australians if we get Australians to embrace and own it. And uh, all underwritten by a Makarata. We have to come together in a determination to make good, to make the peace. I think this is something with a progressive government in place and a progressive leadership at the national level, we can take the country on this journey over the next 10 years. I have great including, hopes. Including the constitutional change? In, including the constitutional change. Um, we will have to make a judgment along the way as to when a referendum is best uh, called for, uh, whether it's at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. It is, it is by virtue of our rules that the Constitution is the hardest thing to do, majority of voters in a majority of the states. But my view is that we have all of the makings, and these makings have been kind of kindling for decades now. You know, the, 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 the kindling for, for the destination is, has, been in, has been in progress for many decades. We can pull it together um, in 10 years if we maintain um, the determination that Indigenous people showed at Uluru, um, and if we have a progressive government at the national level. Um, but, but, but in attaining the ascendancy that I hope we will get at the national level, um, we've, always got to, we've always got to understand that it is the centre we seek. It is the radical centre we seek. The true roots of solving a problem and taking advantage of an opportunity lie in the radical centre, not the radical left and not the radical right. It is at the root of the centre that we will find these solutions. Uh, it's testament uh, to you again, Noel Pearson, as it was two years ago in this same tent in similar heat that this hour has been spent uh, in perfect silence from the audience. Uh, and once again, uh, thank you very much for what you've uh, shared with us today. Thank you.